Welcome to the Uber Entertainment Planetary Annihilation live stream for May 17th, uh, 2013. We're excited to be here. Wanted to introduce uh, everybody. We've got four people on camera today. Myself, John Maver, uh, Steve Thompson. Everybody. Uh, John Scathis Combs on the left there. And Mark Garrett Scattergood. Hey, everyone. Uh, so before we, uh, before we get started, I wanted to do a couple of shout outs. Uh, the Sens and the Pens. I'm a Sens fan. John's a Pens fan. Go Sens. Go Pens. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about real science for a second and throw a shout out to the people over at Planetary Resources who are doing real asteroid mining, which has been hugely inspiring to, to this game. And uh, lastly, uh, our friends over at Edge of Reality who just released Loadout on Steam Early Access. Uh, really cool game using our Ubernet backend. So go check that out. So the first thing we're going to get to here is talking a little bit about what the development process has been like for the last eight months, just kind of set it up. So uh, it's been really interesting so far to, uh, to make this game in the public eye and to kind of get all of the feedback and stuff, but we're going to push it to, to the next level really soon. Yeah. We've already announced the alpha coming out. And so, <clears throat> you know, the general philosophy of, of making this game is to take the people that support us, the Kickstarter backers, the pre-order people, get them in the game, get them to play the game, and let them help us form the game for the next uh, seven months or so. Mm -hmm. So over this, this process, this to me is when the real kind of interesting part of the, of the development process is going to begin. And I think that uh, people are going to be I'm concerned. I'm concerned that people are going to be a little too hard on the game because you know we never feel like things are ready when they're going to put them in front of you. And and I just want to emphasize that our alpha release is going to be a true alpha release. The game is not finished at that point. It is still in development. And those of you who are participating in that process are really going to be helping form the game and and give us tons of feedback on it. And it's going to be. It's going to be a wild ride. It is going to be a wild ride. Uh, I actually think, you know, the last eight months we've been working really hard. The next yeah. eight months are going to be even harder. There's been huge progress recently. Tons and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the year. technology is starting to get to the point where we yeah. can actually do yeah. really cool stuff. Oh, that's great. And so we're going we're gonna to get into that. So all that aside, you know, this is alpha. Everything we show you isn't finished, blah, 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 the usual thing. People complain when I say <laughs> this, but I have to say it. Uh, we have some announcements. So the first announcement is that the game is going to be coming out uh, on Steam on early access the first week of June. And we are going to run the alpha through Steam and through our own stuff through June, July, and August. September, first week of September, October, November is going to be beta. And then the final release date uh, is going to be December. So. When we say final release, I mean, we're going to keep working on this game, keep working with modders to make it better, keep adding stuff, but that's the you know, official kind of like when everyone who's paid in will, will get access to the game. So we're really excited about that, and there's a couple more cool things. Uh, one of the questions that we've had myriads of times is, are we going to be able to play the game on Steam if we pre-order through you guys? So we're happy to announce that everyone who has paid for the game so far will be able to get access to the game on Steam um, once the Steam version actually goes live, um, which will be, like we said, first week of June. So if you go to store.uberent.com and pre-order the game right now, you will be able to turn that into a Steam key. So we're super excited. The process is going to accelerate here. The uh, amount of work that we have to do is just, just yeah. is, is huge, yeah. but uh, we're super excited to, to bring this game to you. So. The next thing, the next kind of segment that we wanted to do here was uh, a little different than what we usually do. Um, in the past, we've kind of taken a lot of questions from the live stream, and a lot of people said, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to pick the questions out there. Why don't you do something else? So what we decided to do was uh, use our Reddit subforum, uh, Reddit slash our planetary annihilation, and effectively get people in there to vote questions up and then take, a, take the top voted questions. So uh, we're going to basically go through uh, a Q&A from the Reddit stuff, go back and forth with the guys, and at the same time, show you kind of some, uh, some of the current, the current gameplay stuff. So uh, Mark is going to be running the camera over there. John is going to be giving us a little bit of uh, color commentary, possibly maybe 
with a little pun here and there. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> Fans will be disappointed if there's no puns. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of want to just get right into the Q and A uh, and and start showing off some of the some of the different uh, elements of the game here. So um, our very first question from Reddit comes from Cola Colin, who is also a very active guy in the forum, who I've gone back and forth with on a bunch of posts on on various things. So. The first question is, have you any new considerations about how players will be able to get an overview of what's going on over the whole solar system? You've dismissed mini-maps and projections as far as I know, but I think it's, it will be a problem to play on multiple planets without a quick way to tell what's going on everywhere. So this has actually probably been, you know, I mean, you've seen all the stuff. This has been kind of a contentious thing. I'm, you know, actively kind of like have been saying I'm anti-mini-map. Yeah. And I think I just want to kind of, you know, clear up exactly, uh, you know, exactly what, what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about not having the information there. It seems like everyone's like, well, if you don't have a mini map that works in kind of this way, I'm not going to be able to get the information that I want. And, you know, this game is about information. It's about strategic information and being able to know what's going on and be able to uh, give orders to people effectively and, and figure out what's going on in the battlefield and recon and all, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, with the picture-in-picture -picture technology, you can effectively create your own mini-map. And I think there's a number of different ways and, and things that can be done to make that more effective. Now, one of the, uh, the things that people have continued to talk about is, like, you know, having a planet unwrapping projection. And I've, I've kind of always been, uh, I don't really want to do that. Well, uh, Ben actually, Ben Golis, our, our uh, shader guy, uh, FX guy as well, you know, whipped up some stuff to kind of like try that and, eh, you know, there might be something there. So we're going to really experiment with the minimap and I don't want to dismiss any particular idea as far as the minimap goes. We want that information to be there. Steve has a real strong vision for the strategic view and, and you know, the base icons and all yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we're actively developing this stuff. So I don't want people to think that, you know, when I, when I kind of diss a traditional minimap, that, uh, that I, I don't mean that the information is going to be available. We'll figure out a way to make this work. Uh, and, and as far as the projection thing, you know, I was, I was kind of taking a hard line on that. And I'm like, you know, we'll, we'll try some stuff because it seems like people really want to see that. So we have a number of ideas that we, that we want to try. So I just want to put the minimap thing kind of to rest for now and say, like, there's going to be a lot of experimentation that's going to happen on the, on the minimap side. Yep. So, so next. yeah. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to add to it is, you know, for anybody who's watched Uber Entertainment over the last five years we've been around, um, that's how we've built all of our games. I mean, MNC and Super MNC were mishmashes of different genres coming together, and it was all done by us trying something and iterating on it and iterating on it and trying it over and over and over and over again. And that's what we're going to do with the whole idea of being able to manage the, the whole game. You know, we're going to be we're going to iterate on managing bases on different planets and on moons and all this stuff going on, and we're going to find what we feel like works the best. Um, we have a lot of RTS experience on in all time, kinds of different genres, so I know we'll eventually come up with something. So we're definitely going to be. That's just the way we work. We don't write up a big design doc and go to that one spec. We try different things and try them over and over and over again. And it's also a lot of what the the alpha is about too. You know, I think people, were, people I think people that. were concerned that I'm that I was saying, hey, you know, yeah. this or that. And I just want to say, like, you know, yeah, I'm kind of anti minimap, but that doesn't mean we're not going to that we're not going to do it. Cool. So uh, the next question comes from uh, someone else, but I'm, this yeah. is really a question for Steve. So yeah, I'm going to let him from, take it. Yeah, it comes from Example Prime. Will quadrupeds be present in the game? And the answer is yes, they will be. We love quadrupeds, they look cool, a lot of design opportunities there, and we already have one in the game right now, it's one of our fabrication units. Well, and, I wouldn't um, have shown a few actually, I'm still building them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we actually wanted to extend that um, design principle to um, uh, commanders as well. Right, which commanders is super are, exciting. that's something that people have, have yeah. asked a lot of questions about, especially with the custom yeah. commanders, is are there gonna be kind of different form factors? Yeah, we're gonna have a few uh, different skeletons. We basically have four right now, right? Yeah, right now. So we're still fleshing them out. We're still coming up with the designs for them. But we really like the quadruped and how it's shaping up. And I think I was going to really like it. So um, yeah, it's going to be, yes, we will have quadrupeds. And we'll have quadruped commanders, which are going to be amazing. They're going to so, be so fun to work so, on. So I mean, on the commander side, it's kind of the idea there is we'll have these different skeletons that are the, the four different bases, the animation sets for yeah. these four different kind of commanders, right? right? 
as well as all the other quad quadrupeds that are that can be in the game. Yeah, like the yeah. dogs running cool. around. Yeah, uh, the, one, one guy was asking about spider bots, and we had talked about having a spider bot in there with functions like that. Is that something we're gonna? Well, you can. We certainly can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, we haven't, as far as the spider bots go, right? TA had these the spiders that could crawl over everything yeah. and the yeah. crawling bombs and stuff like that. I really like all that stuff. So. Oh, that'd be great. So, um, do we have one of those on the screen that we can almost, show? Almost, almost. <laughs> still building. I got every uh, bot I have. Who tuned this? For What's it? up with the economy here? <laughs> We're trying to race up the tech tree. <laughs> it's not balanced yet. <clears throat> um, we'll, we'll come back to that quadruped thing in a, in yeah. a bit. Let's talk about uh, the next question. So, the GDP says, you mentioned during the last live stream there'll be metal points. Will these be randomly assigned on the planet or will they be assigned in reference to where players start to ensure balance? So, um, the general idea there is that uh, the metal points themselves are fairly random. We're still kind of working on the controls uh, to do that. But uh, the, the, the kind of conceptual idea actually for how to make sure that the beginning part is balanced is A, letting you pick your start location. And that happens through basically before the game starts, you can look at the planets and decide where you want to, to, to start. And the system actually gives you a set of start locations that are unique to your team. And they're not the same as the start locations the other team gets. You get to pick from a subset, they get to pick from a subset. And you can kind of like, it's, there's a strategic element to picking where you start and how much metal is there. The next question also factors into this. So let me just read the next question. Could we have more info into the design of the egg concept? Will it be able to be built in-game, used as a quick base on other asteroid planets, or will it be solely for starting the game? So the egg is the thing at the beginning of the game. Your commander comes in, it's the lander, he lands it, and that gives you some amount of resources. So if you pick an area to start that's not as resource rich for some other strategic reason, you can kind of still control how many resources you get at the beginning of the game. Um, the idea is that yes, you will be able to build these lander eggs in the future, and that's how you can expand to more planets. So, you know, you might build a few of these eggs and send them out to the asteroid belt, mm -hmm. fly out there, land, and set up bases out there. Uh, so, that's kind of the 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 uh, short version of the egg concept. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do uh, on the egg itself. So, if you don't mind me interjecting, interject. Uh, that's what you're here for. You're the, the color. You're the color guy the, today. One of the color guys. Hey. <laughs> so, one of the things that. I'm really excited, like watching this game come together. One of the things that's really, really exciting is seeing things that have been done in RTS is done in different ways. And one of the biggest ones is, you know, I, I personally have designed a lot of RTS multiplayer maps, but these are randomly generated maps. So we can't set up start spots to be exactly even. So the, the, the way we're going with them, being able to choose your start spot in this, start spot in this area is, it's awesome because now there's actually a layer of strategy to where you start. If you start and you get rolled over quickly because you started in an open field, it's your own fault. <laughs> you know, you had your chance to, to pick and choose where you start. And the way we're doing it has it gives you enough area so nobody's going to be starting right next to you. So the whole thing and the way it's coming together is really, it's one of the many really, really exciting things I'm seeing about this project. And I could go on for an hour about the many, many exciting things I'm seeing in this project, just as someone who's in the office and seeing the technology and the gameplay come together, it's really quite amazing. So yes, about the metal points and the starts points, it's, it's one of those things that came about in iteration and it's, it's, it's awesome and I know awesome. The, fu the funny thing is, you know, uh, when I said, you know, because I've said publicly before that I like the concept of people choosing their start spot. People are like, they come up with all these problems, right? Like, well, what if they start, you start too close to each other and all this kind of stuff. And there's almost always simple design solutions to these problems. And I was wondering about it. Well, yeah, but that's your job. Yeah. <laughs> so are we ready for this, uh, for this next question? Um, yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, we just had a server, we just had a server crash, so we're um, we're gonna actually be kind of cheating like crazy to try and get some interesting stuff back up and going. So you mean the game is done? Almost like it's yet? an alpha. I know, yeah. almost crazy. crazy. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, modability for a second then, uh, while we're we're waiting for that, and then we'll skip back to the Chrono Cam stuff that we're yeah. gonna talk about. So can you tell us more? This is from Shadow Claimer. Can you tell us more about the modability? and what you intend to provide the players for creating your own content. Is it plausible to potentially see full modded servers players connect to, auto-download the mods, and proceed to play? 
So, you know, as we've kind of uh, been, been describing, uh, modding is kind of a first class uh, citizen of, of this platform. And all, this stuff is not all finished yet. Let me just be clear on that. This is mostly in the, in the planning and, and design stage for most of the moddability stuff, other than you know, making decisions up front that we need to make to make sure the game is moddable. Um, but yes, my intention is to basically have it so that you run your own server, you install whatever mods you want on that server, you connect to that server, it will basically say, hey, you don't have this mod, do you want to download it? And you click yes, and then now you're able to connect to that server in that mod mode. More importantly than that, though, um, we're trying to build flexibility into the system such that you can do interesting server mods and things like that that people don't even have to have on the client. Um, I'll, we'll talk more about that later, but the, you know, the general idea there is because the server is kind of serving up data to the client and we have a web browser in the game, we can use that to, to our advantage. And so the amount of kind of um, interaction with the, uh, with the mod system is, is going to be pretty, pretty extreme. Um, so, like, you know, uh, probably the, the first thing that I would expect to see are, you know, things like unit mods. Yeah. That'll, that, that'll be pretty easy, actually. You just export your stuff to FBX, yeah. which super simple. That, I think that pipeline is, you know, our lives have gotten a lot easier. It's since, super simple, yeah. Since the old days yeah. uh, because of FBX. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just changing unit properties and things like that. There's a pretty configurable system yeah. in there. Yeah. Um, adding new types of terrain and new biomes. I mean, it's like you will have the same tools that we use to do that. Right? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and those tools are just super powerful. Like I, I work with them every day and I'm just always amazed at, at the stuff that you kind of premeditated. Like we're uh, adding layers and layers of features and um, using the, um, the system that you developed. And it's just, I just, I can't believe how extensible and, and how powerful and how creative you can be. Like making these elements that you can just carve stuff out into the planets and the, the most unexpected shapes you'd ever come up with. And, it's I mean, we were, sort of we were really trying to do something there that was that was different from what everyone else is, is doing, like from a terrain standpoint. But actually, you know, in some ways, maybe we bit off, we bit off a lot because it's kind of extreme. Yeah. Um, you know, I went through, all, and I go into this, some of the stuff on my blog at, at Maver's Rants, but we went through all these kind of different, or at least I went through these different incarnations in my head of should we do a voxel thing like a Minecraft, right. or right. should we do, you know, a traditional kind of like cube map cube. terrain, yeah. which just... I just wanted to get away from that. I wanted it to match kind of like what you did in the video, visualization-wise, and I, I think we've, got, I think we're there and and beyond at this point. I think what I re realized was so cool is like one day I was watching somebody play the, the game and I realized, oh man, we're playing this RTS on a sphere that you can rotate around and see lighting differences and the different uh, levels of terrain and carved out. It's just amazing to me. So I'm gonna. Uh, I, that reminds me of this question from Flyer37, uh -huh. who wanted to know: From app awareness, will there be any kind of satellites or orbital thingy, <laughs> technical term, that would allow for large areas of sight through the fog of war? And so, yeah, the answer is you you would you would launch these satellites, and they'll they'll basically be like big visual and radar things that that expose the planet. So the you know generally speaking. Satellites will will matter for fog of war. Radar will matter as well, but the satellite. The idea is that that would give you kind of a large area. Are we? Uh, we're, we're, in the, we're, we're almost back in now. We had to reset wow. the server. Okay, had to reset the server. What about hazards? You want to talk about that? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, I think that actually segues in, yeah. you know into the environmental talk a little bit. So yeah. why don't you talk about that a bit? Well, yeah. One of the questions was uh, concerning. Um, uh, hazards in the game, like environmental hazards. This like, one's uh, from Charles Bukowski. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what does Uber think about environmental hazards, like acid, lava, ice, snow, rocks, trees? Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess we've given some thought to it, but um, like we were talking about earlier today, we don't want to have that. Like units are going to be smart; they're not gonna, just going to drive into lava. They're going to be more intelligent than. Yeah, I mean, so in an RTS game, game, you know, it's like yeah, maybe the lava kills units, but yeah, they're not. They're not going to just gonna drive yeah. in there because yeah, right? exactly. that would be silly. But yeah. you know, obviously, they can disconnect pieces of the map and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's more aesthetic than functional in terms of hazard. We're not going to have a weather system or. Yeah, I mean, you know, the environment. To me, the actual interesting environment here is the is the asteroids yeah. and the planets moving around each other and all that kind of yeah. stuff, and the, the kind of uh, concept that. You know, because people will say, well, are you guys going to have, like, meteor showers? Right, they had this right. meteor shower thing, right? Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, it's the map. And then a <laughs> meteor comes in and smacks into you, and you die. And, you know, imagine that you had a map where you kind of set it up at the beginning yeah. to have, you know, at 10 minutes into the game, this thing's going to hit, and you, yeah. you have to make sure you're not there when it does. Yeah. 
there's I think there's tons of environmental possibilities, yeah. but to me they're not they're not contrived environmental possibilities. Right. They're just the way that the game works. And the, and the tech you built too for our um, planet generator that we were talking about yesterday, like building that big structure, like carving out a huge structure in a planet yeah, and we, building something over the top of it. It's ridiculous. I mean, we're just barely scratching the, the surface, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, the concepts for the metal planet, as everyone's aware of, hopefully, is the uh, the kind of Death Star idea where, you know, this that will have weapons on it that you can power up and thrusters where you can move it around. And, you know, that's been kind of slowly getting fleshed out in terms of yeah. how it's going to work. Well, it introduces new gameplay opportunities too, right? With uh, triggering well, things. Well, things, and... things to fight over yeah, on the yeah. surface, right? That's exciting. It's cool. So I think we're going to go back up to um, Chronocam. Yeah, uh, we good? don't have a whole lot of uh, um, history yet, but we can definitely show some stuff off, show a little bit of a... Uh... Okay, so I want to I want to talk. So the Chrono Cam is our replay system that allows us to you know record the entire game and during the game actually go back and replay stuff. And so one of the big kind of questions that people have been asking about the planets and how they work in general is if you've got these planets and they're rotating around the sun, uh, isn't the lighting direction going to change? Isn't you know isn't isn't that going to kind of be a natural thing? <laughs> and you know the answer to that is uh, is yes. yes. It is, and so uh, hopefully we can show off yep. a little okay. bit of that. Yeah, yeah. you can, you can kind of see the whole. It's going slow now. But yeah. we'll, we'll speed it up. So you there can we see go. It. There's a little faster. And this was another thing recently, like just this week or last week when I first saw this in. Just as someone who's in the office, I walked by. I was like, I was blown away. It was literally a, like a magic moment seeing this happen, and uh, it was. It was incredible. Like I actually sat in awe. The, the technology we're building is really amazing. And one thing about the Chrono Cam, I've heard, I, I've told some other people about it, and I've I've heard people go, "Well, scrub back and forth during watching the game. Well, Starcraft can do that, and this game can do that." It's, it's like, no, you have to understand that this is like rewinding a DVR while you're watching a live broadcast. This isn't downloading a file and scrubbing it back and forth. This is like. DVRing your video game, and it's it's awesome, like really truly awesome. And cool. the whole concept of being able to do this real time is it's revolutionary. It's it's I just, I can't say enough about it. I mean, yeah. The example I always use is being able to like click on your unit and say, "Show me how this died," and you have a window that shows you what was going on when the unit died. Yeah, Th that's. But I don't think everybody quite understands kind of how revolutionary this feature is because. You get to replay in real time. You get to if you're watching somebody play esports and they say, "Hey, let's see that again." You know, they can literally just go 30 seconds, see it again. It, the, there's no downloading. There's no waiting. There's no pausing. It just works. And or I was also love the example of like hitting this, get back 15 seconds, and then play at double speed or quadruple speed yeah. to catch up. You know, so you can mm -hmm. just quickly kind of see what was going on in an area. Play backwards. So. Um, I don't know if everybody also caught the uh, the moon, the temporary moon floating around. The yeah, we can uh, see right there. Yeah, yeah so during the minimap discussion, I was uh, trying to get some uh, things figured out, and so I couldn't actually show some of the uh, visualizations of minimap in other ways. But you know, here you can actually start to see some of the beginning orbital bodies, and one of the things I did not get to show to, before was this view. So when people, yeah, when people ask about the minimap, right, there's this celestial view, we call it, where you know you see your system. Obviously, this this is still uh, fairly raw, actually. But um, you know, as we're working on the kind of system designer piece that lets you set up the orbits and everything, uh, you know, we're kind of fleshing out this this aspect of it. And uh, that actually, that moon there is actually using the moon biome that we've got in there now. So we're starting to get uh, that kind of stuff in there, where you can build different kinds of planets and. Uh, uh, the actual physics for the planetary systems. I want to talk. I want to do a whole live stream on that at some point, because uh, Ryan, the guy that's working on that stuff, uh, you know, is making a really cool physics-based system for this. It's pretty inspiring. Um, you know, and we're trying to do it with real physics. We'll see. You know, I'm. We're not totally convinced that we that we can do it without faking it a little bit. But uh, currently, it's it's pretty wildly uh, uh, real physics. Um, okay, so. No, next question, Charles Bukowski. Has Uber further developed its approach to aircraft carriers and fuel? Um, has a no, NOTA spring style approach where flight and weapon fire deplete fuel been considered? So 
this is an interesting question. I think I've talked about this a little bit on the forum. Um, first off, I, I don't want to say that we have it figured out because in a game like this, aircraft is really notoriously difficult to balance, and uh, you know it's it's tough, and we have to you know it has to kind of. Uh, I mean, it has to be basically be proven through contact with the enemy. Like, we have to have enough data about how this plays to say whether or not this is the right solution. However, the, the current solution, and this applies not just to aircraft but some other weapons as well, is a kind of a capacitor-based recharge kind of style system. So an example would be a bomber might have five bombs when it's built. And they'll, they'll have the bombs probably when they're built, although we could go back and forth on that piece, but let, let's not get into that level of detail. So it's got five bombs, you send it over, it bombs things, it drops its five bombs, and now it needs to rebuild its bombs. And it may recharge one bomb every so many seconds with a certain amount of energy metal draw. So the idea is that you send in your fleet of bombers, they get one good bombing pass in, and then their effectiveness is basically depleted for a while, and you need to make sure that you have the energy resources to actually run them. Uh, so instead of being a fuel-based model, it's more of a weapon-based model. Same with the fighters. So we're, we're going to see how that works out. I'm fairly confident that it'll work out. I don't know, Combs, what you, what you I'm, think. I'm pretty confident, too. Like, you know, John and I actually spend quite a bit of time talking about how to balance air because, like he said, air is very always balanced on, a, on an edge. It either goes too, too weak or too powerful really, really quickly. And the nice thing about the whole building bomb mechanism is it, it works just like... Uh, we're, what we're kind of planning on doing with artillery and the way the color economy works is just, hey, it requires this to build this thing, and it kind of just fits. And when things start yeah. fitting that nicely meshed together... Do, do you want to you explain how like the artillery recharge sure. works? Um, because we have Because of the economy model we have with the streaming economy coming in, uh, one of the things that we're planning on doing for big uh, artillery units, like a, you know the Bertha equivalent, is every shot needs to charge up so you're going to draw some energy you're going to build up a shot build, basically charge your capacitor and then it's going to fire now that can still fire fast we can still do things like uh, the but you know the the gatling gun type artillery pieces it just means that you're going to have to pull from your economy really really fast the charge up time is going to be really quick and it's going to have a big energy draw so your, your energy economy is going to be like boom, 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 but you're going to have to have that kind of energy to support it. So we're thinking about doing the same thing with air. So you're going to have to have the economy to support your air units, or you're not going to be able to use them as much because you're going to have to have them go to a safe place, rest, build up their arsenal again to make another bombing run. And I'm feeling very confident that that'll work out uh, balance-wise. If not, we'll try something different. Yeah, I mean, we could always go back to the kind of TA style where effectively you had to have the energy sitting in storage to fire a shot, right? So a Bertha took a thousand, and if you didn't have a thousand that tick sitting there to be depleted, you couldn't fire the weapon at all. Uh, whereas here, it's more of a softer, your, your rate of fire will slow down, but you won't totally stall. Um, so we'll see how it works out. I, I'm, I'm, I think it's, it's going to work, work out uh, pretty well. Uh, we can uh, show off those quadrupeds now if you want to see them. Oh yeah, let's take a look at the uh, at the at the uh, uh, quadruped. You know, it's funny Andrew, who's who's actually, you know, doesn't get to be on camera that often because he's the guy behind the scenes that runs all all the cameras. Is actually one of the guys that's doing a lot of the animation for this stuff. Well, he's building the units too. And yeah, well, yeah. and building the units and he's you know, game. yeah, Andrew's basically making the game yeah, himself. So yeah, quadrupeds are. are are pretty cool, and uh, they, just, they just look cool. Our, the way that we do animation is just—it's just completely different from what we've done in previous games. People are, you know, some people have been asking me what the differences are. The main issue, the main thing, is that the animation itself, for things like legs moving and things like that, is not part of the simulation. It's just reactive to, you know, the move, the unit is moving at this rate. Okay, that feeds into the animation system. Play this animation, do this blending, and make it look good. And beca so because the we're not paying a cost for animation unless the unit is on screen, it's not part of the sim, uh, we're able to do more intricate animations for less cost than we were able to in the past. Uh, so I, I thought that was pretty interesting. So uh, let's uh, scroll down a little bit here, Andrew. Okay, so uh, I don't want to beat this to death. Uh, I think we've got through a lot of questions here. Uh, we're going to continue to participate in the forums. Uh, I think we're going to do one final one that we picked up from Reddit, and this is from our favorite guy in the world, Nanolave, who's 
Everyone on the team knows who he is because he's very uh, prolific on the forum. So I'll, I'll just throw, throw it out there. Why is the second backer commander named the progenitor? You've talked about things all starting with progenitors. Is this commander one of them? Or has he taken the title for some other reason? Who are the progenitors? And who does this commander think he is? <laughs> so this goes to the lore of planetary annihilation. The lore of PA is actually pretty super secret. Most people on the team don't even know what the lore is. And the main reason for that is because we're still developing it, but we have a great writer who's, who's got a really big backstory that basically explains where, who are the progenitors, cool. where do they come from, how do they associate with the commanders, who are these commanders, what are the different factions, and all this kind of stuff. So I'm just going to tease you with that and say all will be revealed at some future point, but there is a rich lore that we've been developing here, we just haven't actually talked about it. Um, in general, it's actually a big challenge to get story into a game like this. Um, so, you know, you, you know, we have this, this lore that we're building up, but to humanize the characters and everything, I think, is, is, the, is the difficult part. And, and I'm not sure that we'll get there, but, you know, we're going to try to do some really interesting stuff. So, uh, as you can see, the game's coming along. Uh, for those of, of you that missed the beginning, Steam, first week of June, early access. Beta, September, October, November, release in December. Uh, if you pre-order the game at store.uberent.com right now, you will be able to get a Steam key. Um, check us out on Reddit. We really want to build up our subreddit. I participate in there a lot. Mark does, other team members do. Uh, check out our forums as well. Obviously, we participate there as well. Uh, really want to thank everyone that's, that's pre-ordered the game and backed us. Literally, this would not be possible without your, your support. Uh, this game would not exist mm -hmm. without Kickstarter. Uh, without all the fans, without the pre-orders, everything, it all helps us get to the finish line. We put it into the game, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to getting this game in your hands, even if it's even if it's early, even if I'm going to get a lot of flack from people about stuff that's not done. It's going to be a wild ride, so go pick up the game, check out the Steam page, and please spread the word that the beta and the alpha are coming soon. And uh, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm pumped. I yeah. think we we all are. Yeah, so thanks for your support. With that, we'll wrap this up. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Go Penguins. <laughs>